Beatles, that she had a kind of breadth to her artistry. And, um, and I think that's emblematic of Asian American art, that there's a huge breadth and depth to uh, what we can think of as Asian American art. Um, and what I mean when I say Asian American art is any work of art that's created by an American artist of Asian descent. Um, and that's, you know, it's a, it's a flexible definition, um, but that's how I define it in my scholarship and also a class that I taught at University of California on the topic of Asian American art. There have been Asian American artists as long as there have been people of Asian descent in America, uh, particularly after the migration of Chinese laborers to work on the transcontinental railroad in the 19th century. So in order to talk about Asian American art, um, we also need to talk about the term Asian American. And so I wanna spend just a, just a little bit giving you some backstory and some history about this term Asian American that is fundamental to the idea of Asian American art. Um, and it's not a term that always existed. You know, we traf you know, we hear things like Asian American Heritage Month, it feels very much like it was always around. Um, but it's actually a historically situated term. Um, and it comes from the 1960s uh, and specifically from 1968. What I'm showing you here is an image from a zine called Asians Unite um, from 1970. Uh, from a publication at University of California, Berkeley. And um, it's from around the time that this term Asian American was coined, in fact, by a UC Berkeley grad student named Yuchi Ichikoka um, in his apartment at his, in his apartment in Berkeley um, in 1968. He was the founder of the Asian American Political Alliance. Um, and his, he and his wife were civil rights workers who had worked in the American South. And they were thinking about political activism, um, also the anti-war movement, um, and they wanted to kind of bring some of those ideas to their own Asian American community. So what the term initially meant and how it's understood now is um, uniting multiple Asian ethnic groups who have migrated to the United States and thinking about a kind of pan Asianness, even though people have come from many different places in the vast uh, region of Asia. But thinking about some kind of unified experience across um, Asian Americans who have, who have immigrated to the United States. So just looking at this image, I, I just found this actually, I hadn't seen it before, but I pulled it from Berkeley's archives um, to show you today. And I kind of love it because, you know, you have this very stripped down graphic quality um, you have this sense of uh, Asians Unite as being something that's very kind of um, related to political activism and to protest. You see, you know, someone waving a banner in the back and this central figure in the front um, speaking. And the text says, we will fight and fight from this generation to the next. Um, and that's something that I think is also important to the notion of Asian Americanness is the intergenerational, um, and that's something that's always been kind of foundational um, to the term. So I'm showing you here an image of um, Huey Newton, who was uh, one of the founders of the Black Panthers, and Richard Aoki, also a founding member of the Black Panthers. Um, Hugh Aoki on the right, you see, um, was also a participant in the Asian American Political Alliance. Um, and he spoke at one of the rallies at Berkeley, one of the early rallies, um, right after the coining of this term Asian American in 1968. And he said, quote, we Asian Americans believe that American society has been and still is a fundamentally racist society. We Asian Americans support all non-white non liberation movements we unconditionally support the struggles of Afro-American people, the Chicanos, the American Indians, to attain freedom, justice, and equality. So you get a sense, I think, from Aoki's um, comments, as well as his participation in, the, in founding the Black Panthers, that from the outset of this term Asian American, you also have a kind of broader coalition um, of people of different races, a kind of pan-racial interest in community building and uniting, um, uniting together. So just a couple more images I wanted to share with you from Berkeley's um, archives. 
You also get the founding of a group at this time called the Third World Liberation Front, and this was at Berkeley and also at SF State University. Um, so part of the kind of broader activism on college campuses, you have this new term Asian American. Um, and this, this Third World Liberation Front was ex founded upon what I was ex just talking about, this coalitional politics of um, students, student groups of different races. So you had student cultural groups, Asian Americans, the Black Students Group, the Mexican American Student Organization, um, who united in a common rejection of colonialism, of racism, of Eurocentrism, and they kind of came together. Um, and what they were really agitating for was they decided that they thought university campuses should be offering um, classes that dealt with people's kind of ethnic identity. And so you see here members of the Third World Liberation Front and a um, poster from that time, from 1968. And so what they ended up doing, the Third World Liberation Front, was they went on the longest uh, campus strike that's ever been done um, in 1968 and 69, a five month long strike at SF State uh, to, de to demand that the university um, offer uh, foreign departments for American Indian studies, Asian American studies, black studies, Chicano studies. Um, and they really wanted to be able to take these kinds of classes that dealt with their Kind of personal and racial identities. Um, and they were ultimately successful. And so the Third World Liberation Front, and most people don't know this, I didn't know this until learning about them, but um, they're really the reason that we have like Asian American studies, my class in Asian American art, you know, African American studies in any campus um, in the United States is because this started at one university, uh, SF State in California, and eventually spread across the nation. In addition to um, building these kinds of coalitions with the Third World Liberation Front, Asian Americans who founded this uh, term and the Asian American Political Alliance were very involved in anti-war activism. Um, so thinking to Yoko Ono's The War Is Over poster, you know, we're in the same exact moment. And here I'm just showing you a couple images of an Asian American peace rally um, in Little Tokyo in Los Angeles in 1970. So, you know, this is all a bit of a preamble, but I did want to give you um, some sense of this, this term Asian American. And I, I think we can't say Asian American art without thinking directly to this history and the origin um, of, of these terms um, and these, especially these university departments where people like me are studying and teaching Asian American art. So I now want to switch gears. Um, since you're all SAMA fans, um, as am I, I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about uh, works that are in our own collection um, by Asian American artists. And um, the first of which is uh, from 1929. So we've been kind of talking about the 60s and 70s, and now we're going back in time a couple more decades to 1929. Um, when this Three Elephants Bowl, as it's called, was manufactured by the Cincinnati-based American pottery firm called Rookwood Pottery, which you, you may have heard of, a leader in the kind of arts and crafts um, pottery movement. And it was designed by uh, the Japanese-American um, Japanese designer and painter Kataro Shiryamindani, uh, who um, came aboard, and I'll talk a little bit about how he came to be a Rookwood designer. Um, but I really love this work. I saw it in the galleries where it is in the American art uh, pottery case in the second American gallery. So if you're at the museum, um, you can go see it yourself. And I love the kind of cerulean -y blue and the way in which the little elephant trunks hold up um, what is a, a compote dish um, and the way in which the elephants sort of sit back on their haunches. It's just incredibly, incredibly beautiful, also kind of whimsical. There's something super cute about it, even though that sometimes can be a, like a dirty word with art. But, um, but for American art pottery, I think it's something um, that that cuteness is some, sometimes a quality and one that I love in works like this one. So how did um, a Japanese designer, pottery designer, come to be uh, a part of this American um, pottery firm? 
uh, we're now going back in time a little bit more to answer that question. And it has to do with the huge interest um, in the late 19th century and early 20th, into the early 20th century in Japanese art and design um, in America. And so I'm showing you here a picture of um, a shop filled with Asian import goods in San Francisco in 1880. Um, so there was a huge demand of, uh, by American buyers for um, Japanese decorative arts, um, craft, uh, and things like you see in this um, image. And the reason for that is that there's a kind of specific historical reason for this interest in Japanese goods and the ability of a shop like the one we're looking at to function, um, which was the opening of Japan in 1853 by American um, Commodore Perry, uh, which meant a sudden influx, influx of goods. Um, so this was a naval Commodore um, who went to Japan, an American naval Commodore, uh, and took armed naval, naval ships to Tokyo Bay. Um, and essentially forced Japan to open its ports for trade under threat of attack and Japan, you know, agreed. Um, and so after that, you have what's known as the Meiji period in Japan, um, which was a kind of modern period in which um, the country is open to trade and you see both um, Western influence in Japan and also the import of Japanese goods and influence into the United States and into the West. Um, I'll just note here too that this photograph that we're looking at from 1880 was taken the same year as the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, which halted immigration from China. Um, and it was, would not be repealed until 1943. So just an interesting kind of overlap between the interest in Asian import goods, but also a block on uh, migration from Asia. So we see in this picture a lot of ceramics, a lot of porcelain. Um, when you think of paintings by like Whistler, you might think of, you know, the beautiful vases. I don't think I pulled a picture for you, but you definitely, I think, have seen the kind of blue and white pottery that's coming into America at this time. So that's the kind of um, landscape in which uh, the Rookwood Pottery Company is founded. Um, and in Cincinnati, you have a specific event, um, Cincinnati, where the Rookwood Pottery Company is, uh, was located and actually still is. You also have another event that kind of sparks this um, desire for Japanese goods and uh, craft um, and design. And that is the 13th Cincinnati Industrial Exposition, um, which was in the model of the 1876 uh, Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. Um, kind of, if you've seen Meet Me in St. Louis, you know, this was a kind of 19th century phenomenon, turn of the century where you'd have these big fairs and different nations would be represented. You'd have these attractions that were often linked to kind of the cultures of faraway places. Um, and so the Cincinnati Industrial Exposition was one of these big 19th century fairs. Um, and in it, you had this thing called the Japanese Village. Um, and I'm showing you here an image of the Cincinnati Inquirer from 1886 uh, that announces the arrival of the Japanese village. And it says, original, wonderful, and novel. 100 Japanese men, women, and babies in native costumes who daily illustrate the art and industries of Japan. And you can um, keep reading. But uh, essentially, the founder of the Rookwood Pottery Company went to this. Her name was Maria Storer. Um, and she kind of was, you know, really taken by um, the Japanese design and art uh, and people that she saw in this exposition. Um, so she founds the Rookwood Pottery Company, uh, actually a little bit before the Cincinnati Industrial Exposition, after she attends the 1876 Exposition in Philadelphia, which was a similar thing. She's very taken with the French and the Japanese ceramics she sees there. She goes to the Japanese village um, in 1886 in Cincinnati. Um, and then she sees this artist, Kataro Shiramandani. And he is one of the um, artists who is uh, on display, essentially, in this Japanese village. And he is the artist who created Sama's um, Three Elephant Bowl. So Shiramandani was um, 
This is another one of his works. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about him, he was born in Tokyo. Um, he was already an accomplished uh, painter and porcelain maker in Japan when he came to the United States. And he traveled with, um, with the Japanese village. He also worked as a ceramicist in Boston. Um, and it was in 1886 when he came to Cincinnati that he met um, Maria Storr, who was the founder of Rookwood Pottery. And she was a kind of Cincinnati heiress who just was, you know, an artist in her own right. She also hired a lot of women, but she hired him to um, come on uh, to Rookwood Pottery in 1887. So the vase I'm showing you here is more kind of um, emblematic of Shiramai Andani's kind of quintessential style um, that he's known for, which is this kind of beautiful, ornate, painterly uh, decoration. He was maybe the most kind of exquisite decorator that um, Rookwood Pottery had on their staff in the late 19th century. Um, and the vase I'm showing you actually won the grand prize at the Paris Exposition Universelle in 1900. Um, so that gives you a sense that, you know, not only are ceramics coming from Japan in the late 19th century, you know, um, the ceramicists in the United States who are influenced by this Japanese uh, ceramics are then sending their ceramics to France. The French are also importing Japanese goods. So there's a kind of global circulation of um, design principles and uh, of ceramics in this moment. And this, just a fun tidbit about this, if you're ever in Philadelphia after, um, once we're able to all travel again, uh, this is in the Philadelphia Museum's collection and they acquired it um, shortly after uh, it won the grand prize in 1900 and it's still in their collection. So as I mentioned, Shiri, um, Shiri Yamandani was a painter, a pottery painter, as well as designer. So I'm showing you here a bowl that's in the collection of the Met, um, which is also one of his works. Um, and you see that the, de the decoration, like the last vase that we looked at, is kind of drawn from nature. And most of his um, decorative motifs were drawn uh, from, from nature, often floral, often featuring animals, um, both of which we're seeing here. Um, and uh, I think this was an interesting comparison, I thought, because you see some kind of formal resemblance between um, these two kind of stout, um, both the, the bowl on the left and the, um, and our three elephants bowl on the right, um, and also the kind of curvature of the handles and the curvature of the elephant's trunks. Um, you'll also notice in this comparison that, you know, our bowl is significantly less kind of ornate. Uh, it doesn't have that painted decoration. And that's because it comes from the Rookwood production line, as it was called. So a kind of more accessible line, um, which Shiri, Shiri Yamandani was also very uh, active in developing. Um, and he became what was known as a shape designer. So he would design the shapes for these kind of more mass produced um, wares and from 1906 to 1911 he actually designed more than half of all of the new shapes coming out of Rookwood um, and many of the designs uh, that he made were whimsical they were kind of art deco-ish um, so ours is very emblematic of the work that he was doing um, most of his designs were also functional they were trays ink stands um, vases dishes pots uh, paperweights, um, match holders, candlesticks, things that you could use in your home. And so that's something I certainly think of when I think of Rookwood. Um, they also often featured animals like ours, including frogs, penguins, um, elephants, monkeys, and seals are some of the animals that he uh, drew his shapes from. I pulled this um, image of a vessel that we have in our collection in the Asian galleries, actually from our Chinese um, ceramics collection at SAMA. And I thought this was interesting. I haven't actually talked to Sean about this yet, um, the curator of Asian art, um, but I need to. I thought it was striking that you have these elephant handles um, on the 16th century Chinese vase, and then you also have the elephant trunks holding up uh, Shiramayandani's bowl. Um, so I found that to be a kind of striking um, comparison formally. And I guess, you know, 
if you go into our Japanese galleries, you'll see that we, the, the current um, installation has to do with animals in Japanese art. Um, and this is one of the ways I think Shira Mayandani is kind of drawing on Japanese art is his kind of interest in the natural world and especially um, depictions of animals. And then just one more, um, just to give you a little bit more of a sense of Shira Mayandani's output, um, here's just another picture that he designed uh, for Rookwood. This is in the collection of the um, Cooper Hewitt Museum. Um, and uh, I just kind of love this. Also very whimsical, I think, but in a different way than our bowl. It has this kind of pastel coloring, um, this sort of patchwork. Uh, design and so you can see why the Cooper Hewitt is kind of obsessed with this in terms of its design innovation because it is from 1887 and to, to my eye it looks um, like something that would be in a home today. So I think that's one of the other interesting things about Shira Mayandani is he brings this kind of modern, um, modern aesthetic to uh, this um, pottery company from the 19th century. Um, I just wanted to mention too that I think when I look at the elephant bowl in our galleries in the American art pottery case, I also think of something else here in San Antonio that's not um, at the museum per se, but I, I, in my mind is related to the elephant bowl, which is the Japanese tea garden at Brackenridge Park, which I'm sure many folks have visited and enjoyed. Um, and for those, if there's anyone who's not in San Antonio, this is a very beautiful Japanese style um, garden with walking paths inside a, a larger park here. Um, and they're, they're both from a similar moment in time. I guess that's why I think about them together. And they're both made by Japanese American um, designers and artists. Um, so I'll, I'll take a little detour here to talk about the uh, Japanese tea garden. Um, and I actually took my students here. I, I teach a class at Trinity that met at SAMA prior to um, the closure. And uh, on the day that we looked at American art pottery and share my and Donnie's bowl, we also went uh, to the Japanese tea garden. And so the students got to think about these two things together. But here I'm showing you a picture of the Japanese tea garden in 1919. Um, and the idea of the, the tea garden, it was conceived by the city parks commissioner of San Antonio in the early 1900s. Um, so around the time that we've been talking about um, with the influx of kind of Japanese goods and world fairs. Um, and he was thinking of it as, an, as a way to beautify the rock quarry, quarries that were in this um, park that had been abandoned by the San Antonio cement company. So prior to it looking like this, it was a kind of an abandoned, um, not a very beautiful site and a, a quarry. And we can assume, I think, that the commissioner knew about the Japanese tea gardens at um, expositions like the one in 1876 in um, Philadelphia, the World's Fair um, in St. Louis definitely had a huge kind of Japanese section. Um, so this idea of the Japanese tea garden definitely comes out of uh, World's Fairs in the late 19th and early 20th century. And these, those were the same ones, you'll remember, that inspired Rookwood to take on this Japanese designer and the same kind of place that Shiramai and Dani traveled in. What's especially interesting, I think, um, about, the, uh, about the tea garden is that um, you also have this um, Japanese American family and this designer, uh, Kenny Jingu, who's then hired by the city to um, design the beautiful tea, to design the beautiful tea garden and also to live on site there. Um, and they open a tea house uh, upon the, um, upon the uh, opening of the tea garden. So um, Kimi Jingu, who you see here, he's an artist and design, he was an artist and designer pictured here with his family. Um, and he had previously been employed by the US Army to um, sell his watercolor paintings in a shop that was uh, in downtown San Antonio. Um, so that's how he sort of is taken on by the city, 
Um, he's also an artist, a painter, uh, and he works on the garden, works on this quarry, and it's christened in 1919. Um, and in 1926 is the year that they open the tea, the tea house uh, at the tea garden, which is also still there. You can go and it's still called the Jingu um, Tea House. And you, you see his wife, uh, Helen Jingu, here preparing iced tea um, in 1938. So the Jingu family um, resided in this place. Kimi Jingu designed uh, the, the incredibly beautiful um, and kind of strange uh, tea garden with its winding paths and its um, buildings built from the same rock that were drawn from the rock quarry. Um, and they, they lived on site there. They ran this uh, tea house um, up until 1942 when there was the attack on uh, Pearl Harbor um, and they were evicted from their home at the tea garden um, and told not to return. Um, and this was uh, also the same moment of Executive Order 9066 in which Japanese Americans on the West Coast were interned. Um, so as far as I know, the family was not interned, but they were evicted from, um, from the site. And they changed the archway at the garden to say Chinese Tea Garden um, in that moment. And if you go to the tea garden today, you'll still see um, this archway that says Chinese Tea Garden, which was a method of kind of erasing um, the Japanese culture that the city had, you know, and Americans previously loved so much in this moment of Pearl Harbor um, from this site. So um, I wanted to mention this. I know it's a little bit of a detour uh, specifically from our object, but I wanted to kind of recognize um, this other an interesting historical and artistic site in San Antonio and also just think about in Asian American, um, Pacific American Heritage Month, uh, the importance of, of this history and also of these Asian American artists and designers who contributed to our city and also to the art in our museum. Okay, so just shifting gears a little bit, um, I just wanna conclude now uh, on another work that's in our con uh, collection um, by Wai Ching Lam. And this is called Triangle Circles and Rectangles Number Two from 2001. Um, and I see that Mei Lam is um, on the call here as well. And um, everything I'm about to tell you, I know because uh, Mei Lam, who is uh, the daughter-in-law of the artist um, whose work you see here, uh, wrote a beautiful catalog about Wai Ching Lam's work um, and contributed to her artistic career. Um, so if, you know, if anyone has questions about Wai Ching Lam's work, um, I'll defer to May to answer those um, since she is really the resident artist, uh, sorry, expert about this artist. Um, so if you went and saw this work in the gallery, uh, in the modern and contemporary galleries where it hangs right now, you would notice it's actually three canvases kind of stacked on top of each other. So it has this triptych um, design and it's quite large, um, like, um, you know, many abstract kind of abstract and ab abstract expressionist and post abstract expressionist paintings. It's interested in this canvas that's sort of sits on the wall and confronts you um, with its largeness. You'll also notice that the canvas is, um, employs only primary colors. Um, and this is actually typical of Wai Ching Lam's uh, paintings. Um, and I'll just read you now a little excerpt from um, part of an artist statement that's published in uh, Mei Lam's catalog in which uh, Wai Ching Lam says, quote, a lot of people like blending colors and I'm all for it, but primary colors have their place as well. Look at the solid colors in men's and women's clothing. When I was studying at the Art Students League in New York City, an instructor told us that primary colors are just as good and as beautiful as any others. With that in mind, the shapes in my paintings became bright and alive." End quote. So when I look at um, this painting in the gallery, I also think of another artist famous for working in primary colors, um, Pierre Mondrian, and uh, his 
color block paintings, which you've likely seen in reproduction um, from the early 20th century. And so you see a really similar palette across um, these two artists working in different, very different eras um, and a kind of love of primary colors, which um, I think you got a sense of from hearing that artist statement from Wai Ching Lam. Um, and looking especially at the Lam painting, you have this feeling, I think, she's, she uses the words active and alive, and I think you really get a sense that there's a kind of celebration of color and planes of color, of geometry and of shapes um, in this painting. And um, one thing that I was thinking about just looking at this uh, is that there is a kind of brightness to the color and um, you know it's a bit hard to see in PowerPoint, but I think we take take for granted bright colors. Um, as she mentions, you know, men's and women's clothing have these bright primary colors. We're saturated in media that has bright colors, but to get paint to look this bright is actually a challenge for an artist. Um, and is, you know, a really, a really a kind of feat that I think you see across uh, her works. This is another work from our collection at SAMA, Frank Stella's Double Scramble. Um, it's not actually on view right now, um, but it has been on view. You've perhaps seen it in the galleries before from 1968. Um, and this is another work in our collection that I think of definitely as related uh, to Wai Ching Lam's. Um, if her three tripartite uh, canvas is a kind of triptych, then Frank Stella's is, you know, the horizontal diptych cousin. Um, to her work. So I think Suzanne's on the call, but it would be kind of fun to put these two um, near each other one day uh, because I think they really speak to each other. Um, and again, you have that same feeling of a kind of interest in color and brightness um, in pop and op uh, and the kind of science of seeing. Um, seeing colors is something that artists like Frank Stella uh, were interested in and something that I think possibly um, Wai Ching Lam was, was thinking about as well. So just to show you a couple um, others of her works, these are not in our collection, but are reproductions that I took um, from May Lam's fabulous um, uh, catalog. Um, and you're seeing here an early work by Wai Ching Lam from 1975 called Again a Village, and then one of her later works from um, 2001. Lam was not a fully self-taught painter, um, having attended the Art Students League in the 1960s in New York, um, as you might have noticed in the artist statement that I read. Uh, but she also had a career not just as an artist, but um, as, as a scientist, a physicist, I believe, trained at Radcliffe and MIT. And she immigrated from her native Hong Kong um, when she was only 22 years old to attend Radcliffe. Uh, and she was one of only three Chinese students um, at that time uh, in, I think it's the, in the 1930s or 40s, um, May. You can feel free to jump in and correct me if I'm getting any of this long, wrong. wrong. Um, but I think you get a sense just looking at these two works of the kind of, her kind of science background um, and her interest in kind of scientific precision. Uh, and also the kind of science of seeing, as I was just mentioning, the idea of the kind of the optical and the processing of color um, is something that perhaps her kind of scientific training um, brought to her work, but especially the kind of precision. Um, and May did mention to me that uh, when making these works, um, Wai Ching Lam would sort of map them out in her mind completely before uh, um, kind of realizing them on canvas and that she she wasn't sort of um, as the abstract expressionist kind of emoting but rather kind of executing a very clear plan. These two paintings, one from 75 and one from 2001, um, also give you a sense that her career as an artist was split into uh, two periods. Um, works from the 60s and 70s, and then works from the 90s and 2000s. And there was about a two decade break in between um, where she really didn't paint at all. Um, so some, something that's interesting, I think, to think about an artist who is you know, making the kind of work you see on the left and then who stops making work completely for two decades and then picks up the brush again um, in the 90s when she's, I believe, in her 80s um, and 
starts painting again um, and making work like the one you see on the right. These are two photographs also drawn um, from May Lam's fabulous catalog uh, that give you a sense of um, Wai Ching Lam's uh, uh, life story, very fascinating life story. Um, here she is in 1944 with her husband Wing Ching Lam um, in Massachusetts at MIT where they were students. Um, and that was sort of prior to that early uh, part of her career in the 60s and 70s when she's making um, paintings like the one you see on the left. And then uh, here she is in 2001 in a photograph taken in San Antonio. Um, where she's making and kind of, I think you can see from the canvas, making a work that is very kind of mapped out and methodically um, plotted onto the canvas. Um, so I will defer to, as I said, I'll defer to May um, if there, anyone has questions uh, about um, Wai Ching Lam's work, um, but I thank her again for her great support of the museum, but also her contribution to scholarship and Asian American art scholarship. Um, that by uh, writing about um, this great artist who we have in our collection. So I'll conclude my talk here um, with this comparison. I know we covered a lot of ground and um, you know, I'm, I feel very much like I'm in <laughs> teaching my class at Trinity and I'm trying to kind of race through all of the uh, things that I think are important in an American art or an Asian American art survey, but if you'll think back to 40 minutes ago, we were talking about Yoko Ono and her cut piece, um, the origin of the term Asian American in the 60s and 70s, um, and then all the way through here to this very contemporary work from 2001 that we have in our galleries. Um, and I like to think of these two works together. I don't think that there's, I would have thought of them together, um, except for this conversation with you all tonight, but now that I've placed them together, you know, I've been thinking about how um, there's some kind of sharpness in Yoko Ono's work, of course, with the scissors in this work called Cut Piece from 1964, the act of kind of cutting and of violence, but also of generosity. Um, and thinking about that sharpness in relationship to the sharp angles and geometry and kind of um, dance of triangles that you see in uh, Wai Ching Lam's painting on the right. And I guess, you know, this might be a little bit of a stretch, but that did get me thinking about the importance of Asian American artists in terms of a kind of sharpness of um, perception. Uh, the artists that I've talked to you about tonight are just, you know, a tiny sliver of the many great Asian American artists um, there are in, you know, the history of American art. Um, but I think that especially these two Asian American women and other Asian American artists bring a kind of sharpness and incisiveness in their ability to see and participate in and generate American culture and art. So um, with that, I would be happy to hear from anyone. Um, if you have any questions, um, that's, pretty much what I have prepared for you. I do have, you know, some other slides of other great Asian American artists that I love. Um, if there aren't questions, we can jump into that. Um, so let me just look at the chat here to see if there's anything. Okay, so it looks like um, there is a question about, is there a rock garden inside the Japanese tea garden? And yes, it is a kind of um, rock garden with ponds and uh, various foliage. Um, many plants were brought from a nursery and planted there when uh, Jingu was building the garden initially. And many of the structures, and um, for those who haven't been to the garden, many of the structures, including the tea house, but also the kind of pathways and other architecture inside the Japanese tea garden are made from the quarry stone that was um, left over from the quarry that previously uh, was in that space. So let me know if you have further questions, Adrian. And then I see a question about, do we know what Lamb's inspirations were? Um, reminds me of deco jewelry and perhaps um, May could answer this question. Oh, you're, let me, or can you unmute yourself or you? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, 
Thank you so much. It was a wonderful uh, lecture you gave. And um, first of all, the inspiration for my mother-in-law's artwork was based on science and, and math. And also, uh, she also used art as her life mission. And that kept her together from many different backgrounds. And um, I, I have to say at this time, in honor of all the people that helped with the San Antonio Museum of Art, is SAMA that started a lot of activities for the Asian Americans, including the Asian Festival, which is now very big. And uh, I was very fortunate to be well accepted into the museum very early. I was one of the early uh, people that joined the museum. And I feel that we are very lucky in San Antonio that Asian Americans have a lot uh, of opportunities and participation. But anyway, I just want to say that I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, May. Um, and yes, I um, recently learned that you were the founder of the Asian Festival, which um, I'm, I and I'm sure others have attended at uh, the UT um, campus downtown uh, of the Institute of Texan Cultures and was like massive, the kind of massive event that we might not see for a while now, but um, it was massive this year. So thank you for all of your work um, in the Asian American community. Uh, here in San Antonio for the museum and also um, on this scholarship. Um, and yes, to the, the point about um, uh, Wai Ching Lam's work being inspired by science and math, um, I think I've, I read in your catalog that she also taught math at um, the St. Paul School in Hong Kong um, and that she was also, I mean, it sounds like she was a kind of brilliant scientific and mathematical mind. And so I think that's interesting for um, for those of us who might think of, you know, science and art as separate things, um, to see this artist who was, you know, really a, a professional scientist um, and teacher of math and also a great artist and how those things actually um, kind of play out on the canvas. And just with the two works we're looking at here, I mean, you do get the sense that there is a kind of equation being worked out um, on in either of these canvases and the kind of uh, way in which it all fits together in this sort of jigsaw puzzle like way. Um, okay, I'm seeing one more question um, from, uh, from Johanna about the Japanese village um, and, um, and a question about whether Lamb's works are on display at SAMA. And yes, this work is on display at SAMA in the Modern and Contemporary Gallery. And since the museum is now open, you can go and see it in a safe, socially distant way with a mask. Um, and just to go back to this uh, newspaper article from Cincinnati in 1886 about the Japanese village. Yes, um, the Johanna's question is, was the Japanese village, a display of humans, and it, it was. In these, in these world's fairs, you would have um, people from, sometimes from these countries or, you know, who identified with the race on display, um, being displayed in these kind of <laughs> pseudo uh, anthropological um, displays, uh, but these were also, you know, actual communities of people, and Kataro Shiramayandani um, was part of this, uh, this community. Um, and I guess the, my, I couldn't find actually a picture of the Japanese village um, at the Cincinnati Exposition, um, but my sense is that each of these kind of crafts for people and artists would have been engaged in their craft, and that's part of what people would have been kind of coming to see, is seeing Shira Mayandani kind of engaged in the act of painting. Um, but there also is a kind of, you know, very 19th century uh, notion of of race in, embedded in this as well. And the idea of kind of displaying people is um, something that these World's Fairs were very much about, but kind of makes us cringe, I think, today. Cool. I have a couple of comments. Sure. Uh, the three elephants both, you notice all their trunks are up? That's for good luck. Sorry, oh, the trunks of the elephants. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, that's for good luck. 
when the oh. trunks are up, that's good luck. When the trunks are down, no one wants to have a thing to do with those elephants. <laughs> That's amazing. I didn't know that. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I love that idea that um, that there's something potentially lucky about the design. Maybe that um, was part of Shermayandani's logic in making this as, and maybe we should call it a lucky ball. I understand from various uh, interior decorators that no room is well done, unless it has a piece of blue and white, whether mm. it's Japanese or Chinese or Taiwanese or, or uh, Norwegian or Swedish or wherever, but it needs a piece of blue and white to be a completely well-decorated room. Yeah, I um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, that's something I think, you know, even if we haven't kind of heard it in, in the adage form that you definitely see blue and white pottery around still in people's um, houses. It's very beautiful. Um, I myself have, you know, a blue and white a willow pattern plate. And so one of the things that I loved learning about um, this kind of origin of ceramics and the opening of Japan and influx of Japanese goods and, and Chinese design into American art is that it's kind of explains why that's still the case um, today. And we see the origins of some of these kind of trends in decorating that are still um, part of our, yeah, part of our cultural um, conversation. Well, one of my favorite pieces that I have in my home is a piece that I picked up in an alley in Tokyo on my way to a no theater. <laughs> It was, it, it was a really pretty piece and I still, I still have it. So thank you very, thank you very much. This has been a lovely, lovely talk, discussion, viewing, etc. It's wonderful. Thank you so very much. You're very thank kind you. and very knowledgeable. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for bringing up the history of the 1960s and the history of the Japanese tea garden in San Antonio. I think that was very, very good to, to, to play, play that back, <laughs> live through those periods. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, thanks both of you for your comments. And um, I, yeah, I agree. I, you know, I am new to San Antonio as of last year. I came here to work at Sama and Trinity and as a postdoc, and I so I'm new to that history about um, the Brackenridge uh, Japanese Tea Garden, and I think, like you said, it's just um, so important. And you know, I could give a completely different lecture about the history of porcelain and the willow pattern plate and blue and white pottery in American art. Um, I could also give a completely you know, separate lecture about the history of um, Japanese American artists and internment. Um, and as I mentioned, the Jingu family, I don't think they were interned, but um, the period of internment really affected many, many Asian American artists. Uh, there were also many Asian American artists who continued working um, in internment camps. Um, right now, you know, we can't go see it, but there's a, there was a great exhibition up at the uh, Smithsonian American Art Museum of the um, Japanese American landscape painter Chiro Bada. Uh, and it was previously on view um, many other places. I saw it actually in California, but um, perhaps when the Smithsonian reopens, uh, folks will be able to go there and see it. But um, he was an artist who was a great landscape painter. Um, he was interned and he actually continued to um, make um, work in the internment camp and actually run a number of um, art classes out of uh, Topaz. Um, and the other camp where he was held, so um, incarcerated. Uh, and he was also a Berkeley um, art professor. So kind of interesting crossover uh, over all these histories, a lot of it in California um, for Asian American art, uh, but um, some of it right here in San Antonio and in Samus galleries. And so um, I'm grateful to share a little bit uh, with all of you um, and uh, thank you all for your comments and um, I think we're just about out of time. Yes, thank you so much, Shinchi, for that very informative talk. And um, thank you 
everyone for participating and for joining us this evening. We really are thankful. Um, and so, yeah, have a, have a wonderful evening. All right, thank you. Yes. Bye. All right. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm just going to end, um, end it all for everyone. So uh, peace out and have a really fabulous weekend. Visit the museum, sign up for tickets online. Bye everyone, thank you.